Well, I want to dare to question why we're so afraid of getting older. Because even people of 25 today are worried about their wrinkles, and we don't dare talk about it in public. Now, anyone who's got hair the color of mine knows about the invisibility syndrome. My hair started to go gray when I was 35, and I immediately started dyeing it back to its original chestnut brown color. And I began to dread the appearance of this tide mark of white down the middle, and it was expensive and it took a lot of time. So when I got to 50, I said, that's it. I don't want to do that anymore. And I cut it this short, and I went white almost overnight, and I became invisible. And invisibility is probably one of the key things about getting older, because all our emphasis now is on looking younger. And that's what we put our passion into, what we spend our money on. Um, every day, Western media bombards us with encouragements to make ourselves look younger because you're worth it. Um, you know those face cream ads for mother and daughter, and there's these two women in them, and they both look about 19, and we are supposed to look like that. Um, I've thought hard about facelifts. I've looked in the mirror and gone like that and like that. Um, do you know how much the world spends on anti-aging products today? That's anti-wrinkle creams, Botox, liposuction, hair transplants, facelifts, a lot. $274 billion a year. With that money, we could eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. We could enable uh, people worldwide to have access to clean water. And we could stop children dying in pain and squalor. And still have 49 billion left over. So what's it about this obsession with looking younger? Is it at base a fear of death? I wonder if it's not more to do with an emptiness inside that puts all the emphasis on what we look like outside. An obsession with image, with how we perform, with what we appear to be that's masking something. And um, I, I am fed up with it. I've had enough of it. Um, I'm fed up with it because it's robbing us of who we really are. It's robbing us of our sense of self. It's robbing us of our wisdom. It's robbing us of our usefulness. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's cheating us of the real contribution we can make to the world right now. Um, a man I know who has exquisite taste says that the most classically beautiful woman can be entirely unsexy and unattractive if she isn't fully alive in her body. If she, isn't, if she doesn't have that vibrancy. He says that energy and aliveness is the source of attractiveness. So what does that mean, being happy in the body you have? I think it means not having to be uh, what the magazines want us to be, uh, not minding if we're not like the magazines want us to be. Uh, I think it means being content with what is. And realizing that what is is our, is our great, great gift. Um, obsession with image 
is um, it's tiring. It's never ending. Whereas if our if our emphasis turns inward more uh, into what really our life is about, what turns us on, what makes us feel electric, then that starts to glow outside. So I resign from the world of um, of Botox and facelifts, and I want to concentrate on what the world really gets drawn to, what the world sees is our energy. Um, and I want to concentrate on that. Now, please don't um, resort to saying, well, it's all right for her. The truth is, it's all right for all of us. Because just think of the person you know who has energy, who has real aliveness. And what, what, what does that come from? It comes from living the life we want. Uh, it comes from good health, of course. It comes from exercise. But it also comes from our, our sense of our own sensuality and what we can contribute, how useful we can be. Um, and um, if there was ever a time that the world needed us to be useful, it's now. Um, so just to go a level deeper in this excavation, if you like, of growing older, uh, what most people fear is pain and loneliness. Uh, and um, we, we're worried about what will happen when we get ill, when we may not be able to look after ourselves, when we may have to depend on people who might not care that much. My mother and my grandmother died of multi-infarct dementia. And then my eldest brother and then my second eldest brother also. And it was heartbreaking to witness their suffering, to watch the person that I knew and loved disappear while the body was still there. And as the population ages, we can expect a tsunami of Alzheimer's patients. Um, you and I will cost society more in the last six months of our lives than in the whole of the rest of our existence. If we are likely to be put in a home, which is what happens to you in the West, and um, we may be being cared for, for by people who don't know us uh, and don't mind that much. Uh, we may be treated with humiliation, uh, with contempt even. And this contempt destroys old people's self-esteem. Uh, and the only antidote is love. And since love may not be forthcoming from family, since friends may not be around, and the people who look after us may not care, that love has to come from inside. And developing the ability to, for that love to come inside, from inside has to start now, however old you are in this instant. I don't think there is anything more useful than that any of us can do, then learn to love ourselves. And there are lots of ways to do it. How? Well, I can only speak for myself and, and what I do. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is gratitude. To wake in the morning and go to sleep at night feeling how lucky I am to have the life I have. Um, it makes me happy, and I think it gradually over the years it's changed my whole attitude to life. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be standing here. The other thing I do is I meditate, and I meditate because it gives me peace of mind. Um, it um, it actually it calms me down if I'm anxious, but um, it also makes me smile, and it means I'm never lonely although I live alone. 
And the other thing I do is every day I have to be somewhere with my feet on the earth. I have to be in nature, outside, in touch with things that are alive. I have a little garden and I grow my own vegetables and I break my nails and I love it. Um, so going one level deeper, what about, uh, the f what about the deepest level, which is our fear of death? And Western culture doesn't really approve of death. Uh, we don't talk about it. Sure, we sentimentalize it and we put flowers on it, but we put it in the ground as soon as possible and forget about it. Uh, unlike some other fortunate cultures that teach people to approach their death with curiosity. Uh, the Buddhists, for example, encourage everybody to really think through their death moment by moment. Um, and we, we just don't do that in the West because we're obsessed with speed and economic growth and youth. And let me just tell you a little story about speed that made me laugh. Uh, a journalist was writing an article about how the market was driving whole economies to the wall. I think he was writing about Spain in that case. And he went and asked experienced market makers what they diagnosed was happening. Uh, answer, we're range bound with a slight bias to the downside. Translation, we've no idea what's happening. We've no idea what's happening in a Eurozone crisis being traded by 50,000 supercomputers. So, what are the gains, what are the actual gains of growing older in a culture that so much values speed and youth? Well, for starters, it's that when we're too old, old to be arrested, too frail to be arrested, and too, and we're not employed so we can't be fired, we're the ones who can speak out. What is it that you've always thought was wrong and you've never dared speak out about? When you get to my age, now's your moment. Um, what is it that you would stand up for, even put your life on the line for. Because um, when we lose our fear, we are more used to the planet. Everyone wants to be useful. In, in all the surveys, that's what people really want is to be, to make a contribution. And when we are useful, uh, that emptiness that I mentioned disappears. You know that survey that was done by nurses who asked their dying patients what were their five major regrets? And the very top one was, I wish I had had the courage to live a life more true to myself. So finally, what about wisdom? Now, I had the privilege to work with Richard Branson and Peter Gabriel to bring into life this concept uh, of global elders. They said that since the world is a global village, it needs global elders. It needs wise, experienced leaders uh, who can help the world make better decisions. So we combed the world for such people and brought together 12 of them un under the blessing of Nelson Mandela with Desmond Tutu as the chair. And from this region, it was Dr. Lakhdar Brahimi, who I'm very happy to say has just been named as envoy to Syria. And the, um, what these elders have done is below the radar, but unbelievably powerful. They have gone into countries at war and negotiated very much behind the scenes to prevent and resolve conflict, particularly in countries like Sudan. 
And so those uh, older, wiser people who can, who lived long enough to see over the horizon and see what the world is going to need and help the world make decisions in line with that instead of the short-term fixes that we're used to. And every culture in the world has a mine of wisdom that we can use. Um, if we um, it, Just imagine how amazing it would be if China were to reintroduce the ancient wisdom of the Tao Te Ching, written 2,500 years ago, uh, and demonstrate it to the world. I think verse 46 is my favorite. And it goes, um, there is no greater wrong than living in fear. There is no greater misfortune than having an enemy. And there is no greater uh, illusion than trying to defend yourself. Whoever is free from all fear will always be safe. And finally, from Islam, from the poet Hafez, this is the season to know that every thought and every action is sacred. This is the time for you to deeply compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace. This is the time to know that everything you do is sacred. Thank you.